the rape. It's a neologism created by my wife that describes the act of giving unsolicited psychological therapy to someone who has not asked for it. The reason I'm bringing this up is I've been processing some thoughts of late that I'd like to share with you in an act of possible group therapy. I don't wish to be accused of being a therapist, so there is a time code below this bag of poo. I thought we'd stop here for a couple of minutes. It's so insanely beautiful today. I'm trying to fall off that cliff, Henson. So I want to roll this back a little bit. I grew up, and I'm not uh, signalling for any sympathy here, I grew up under the cloud of bullying. The action of bullying is, I think, in its simplest form, is a suppression, I'd say, of the Spanish word duende, your inner spirit. It, it, it suppresses that. It, it, it suppresses your inner belief in yourself, that you are good enough. So you're indoctrinated to feel that you are a lesser mortal, certainly lesser than your bullies. And as a consequence, I remember very clearly thinking to myself, but they're lazy sods, all of them. And I'm a lazy sod, as all blokes in their late teens are. The one thing you can do is outwork all of these people. And that now has become an ingrained modus operandi for everything that I do. In order to work harder than the person next to you, I think you need to make these things an obsession. This MO is actually an unhealthy one. This entanglement, enmeshment within the machinery of my career came to a breaking point about three and a half years ago. I was getting to work earlier and earlier and earlier every day. So it was first four o'clock, then it was three o'clock, two o'clock. And it was the point that I turned up at 11 o'clock in the evening to start the next day that I really felt, well, it was pointed out to be by someone I'm forever thankful to, Stanley, our now head of production, that this may be problematic, certainly unsustainable. So I decided to pull what's known, I believe, in therapeutic circles as something called a geographical, to run away from an unhealthy behaviour or situation, not realising that you are wholly responsible for that. So you're not changing, you're just changing your location, as I think they say. So I pulled a geographical, moved to X, and the first thing I had to unpack was myself. I'm being over poetic here. Basically, has the move to Edinburgh worked for me in that respect? The answer is, regrettably, no. So the reason I'm raping you is because by displaying this poor hygiene, I'm achieving the opposite goal of this channel, which is to get out in the open and just go, get out in the open and tell narcissists to go fuck themselves. So that's the first time I've sworn on this channel in a long time. I don't know if you've noticed that. Basically, my kids have started watching it. It's not just the amount of work we take on, it's the amount of hours we dedicate to it, the agony of procrastination, of, of cramming last minute, feeling that we're not working unless we're you know, working all hours God sends, even though we know at the heart of it what we do, composing, coming up with a tune, takes seconds. I'm going to be candid. Spitfire, when it started out, was a selfish means of Paul and I getting some really good orchestral samples for free. The only way we could work out how to do it was to sell it to our friends. So it wasn't an obsession, it was a nuisance for me, a massive nuisance for Paul, but we are men of our word and felt committed to this group of basically our peers, our friends, and we committed that to that for two years. And it was easy for this business to become an obsession. We spent so much time thinking about sampling, how we could make all of our lives more fun, more interesting, easier with orchestral. That's where the emotional obsession set in alongside my MO, and which I think I share with Paul, is we simply have to put more time, energy, more investment into orchestral sampling than anyone else. And I guess this is when the transition from it being an obsession born of an entrepreneurial necessity into, I would say, a true love. And when it became a true love to me was when I felt that on quite a grand scale, Spitfire, was me sticking two fingers up to those bullies. You don't need to be the best theoretician. You don't need to be the best piano player. You don't need to be a nasty piece of work treading on other people to get to the top. You don't need to be of a privileged background. You just need to be brilliant with your imagination. Paul and I had mistakenly stumbled into this last vestige of snobbery and conservatism, the world of orchestral, 
classical. We're part of an enormous tide of people who are proving that anyone from any background who have been bullied, who have been suppressed, anyone can do orchestral. Difficulty therein is London is 500 miles that way and I thought by coming here and by growing and expanding the business, letting go of the artwork, letting go of the design, letting go of the marketing, letting go of you know production, I very rarely attend these sessions anymore. I guess I do maybe two projects a year, which I call mine. I thought I could pull away and I thought I could pull away from it being an obsession. And I think what we've come back to realizing is what is Spitfire? It is things that Paul and I love. And we're a bit mental. There's quite a lot of mental people at Spitfire who also do things that they love. I mean, the LCO project, I was a bit like, all right. We ask Olafur, what is it that you love? What do you want? So that's what Spitfire is. It's people's love condensed in sample form. So I guess when I'm in a long way around way, what I'm saying is I'm embracing the fact that I'm a Spitfire lifer. As a consequence, I really need to look at the sustainability of my current lifestyle. So the idea, the hope is to create a node here in Edinburgh. We have a node in New York, which we want to expand. We have a node in LA, but I am, as part of this baby steps, opening a full-time job position, which is where you may be able to help me. If you know anyone who is excellent with this stuff, to help lubricate making our lives more fun, making orchestral a possibility for everyone and helping people monetize their brilliance. I put some details in the video description down below, but predominantly what I'm looking for is someone who is an excellent editor to help me just take on this burden. Every time you see a tutorial, whether it be for Spitfire or as part of this channel, everything's been edited by myself. And I think that I can get help there without losing the personal touch that I have on this channel. There's a link to the job description down below. And you know, if any of you feel that you know someone who would be interested in this, who's based and lives in or around Edinburgh, uh, I'd be most thankful. Right, quick slurp of the coffee, and then let's head down to the shed. Right, next up, this memory competition. If you recall in this video linked above and below, Jake and I made a mega template with all 414 articulations, the 55 different instruments with BBC SO in, and we asked you to guess the preload buffer size. Now, I need to wake these stacks up. Now, this is sponsored a bit of a debate. These memory displays vary slightly between the different instruments. Your largest part of this memory component is the aggregate preload buffer RAM usage for the plugin. The other smaller component is the RAM usage for each individual preset. And that will be dependent on things like the number of articulations and the articulations types. My worry is that it would be an arbitrary figure if I've asked you to estimate to within a decimal point. Say, for example, the piccolos are going to sh show less of a memory footprint than, say, the piccolo longs. It'd be very similar, but it will be out. So what I thought the fairest way of doing things, and I checked this with the development team, they agreed was to create just a blank preset like that. You can see that we're climbing up the charts there. So what's it going to be? Well, let's let the fireworks stop, let it load itself up and see what the magic number is going to be. So we can see that each instance of the plugin is a very small amount, maybe 20, 30 megabytes. So occasionally, you'll get it going above the 11.4 figure to 11.5. But basically, I think the prize goes to 11.4 gigabytes. Now, someone brought up something that's absolutely correct, that you will see a disparity between that and the amount of footprint that, say, for example, the door logic is taking up. So the best way to find out how much a template like this is having on one's memory we need to go to Activity Monitor. Now, bearing in mind, this template is absolutely enormous. The kind of, you know, if, if I were to put a separate articulation on each track, like say John Powell does, it will be about six, 700 tracks. So the kind of track count that real high-end pros use. Now, because of the amount of busing, basically Logic needs to grab more RAM. And if you recall on the competition, I said that it was whatever the memory display displayed here, but Logic is basically running at 25 points. 
2.25 gigabytes. So someone else also asked about the video that I did on the Spitfire channel linked below, which is how I made the trailer music and what was the footprint of that. Let's go back and check. So whilst we're demonstrating 5.33 gigabytes for this trailer arrangement, I have to stress that these are all in one. So every track you see here has, and sometimes several pages of articulations loaded. So basically what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strip out all of the articulations. So 1.65 gigabytes for that arrangement and then 7.48 gigabytes for Logic. So the way that Logic is threading that, I don't know, and I don't know compared to VE Pro, compared to Cubase, what that kind of impact would be. So sorry again for being a bit therapy this morning. As a passing note, I genuinely think disregarding sleep and working all hours that God sends and turning your job into an obsession is a dangerous practice. I know I'm not going to dissuade many of you from pursuing your career like this, but I think it would be remiss of me not to voice this concern. I do know composers who aren't obsessed with it. I know composers who are Oscar winners. I know people who are decorated massively. I'm, I'm afraid to say it's often the result of some form of trauma that means that there is a recalculation, a recalibration of one's attitude to work, whether that be a divorce, but often it's medical. I had a medical thing happen to me when I was 25 and I think that was the wrong time for something like that to happen. I had a brain hemorrhage and if anything, it made me want to live my life to the fullest from that moment on. So, you know, I've had years of um, not only being a workaholic playing hard to a hedonist, which is why I look like I do at the not so tender age of 47. I was very pleased to see that there's been a study in the UK that says one of the most effective ways of protecting your state of mental health is to get out into the open. For any of you that are parents, we know that children you know, it gets to a point when they're very young, you just have to get them out of the house. We are children who pretend to be grown-ups. So if nothing else, if you're gonna obsess about work, if you're gonna do those 17 hour days, for the sake of Beyonce, our Lord, just get out and about every once in a while. Much love to you all. Thanks as always for your support. Do subscribe if you haven't done already. Ding that bell if you wanna be notified the next time I put a video up. Take care of yourselves and see you next time.